welcome, welcome to We Are DB. I am Brenton, joined by Danielle. That's me. Thanks for joining us as we count up the IMDb's best movies of all time and discuss some of the greatest films you mightn't ever have seen. This week, rated as number eight on the internet movie database by millions of film lovers from around the world, is Pulp Fiction. <laughs> Released in 1994, starring Samuel Jackson, John Travolta, Bruce Willis and Uma Thurman, among others that we'll get into later. Pulp Fiction is a non-linear series of stories of criminals set in Los Angeles. As the title, the opening text and the cover art suggests, the film's style is heavily inspired by pulp magazine genre of the early to mid 20th century, which Hmm. were known for their snippets of graphic violence and quirky dialogue. The film is written, directed, and starring Quentin Tarantino. Now, I wanted to talk a little bit about Tarantino's work as a whole here, Mm -hmm. because he definitely has his own sort of feel. I remember. I think the first Tarantino film I ever saw was Reservoir Dogs. Yes, I made a note to introduce you to his work in the order of release. We sat down and watched that, and all of them, I was just like, what the hell is this shit? You know what I mean? He's one of those... Where you kind of, you love him or you hate him. And anything I've heard about his stuff has definitely elicited those kinds of responses. And he's grown on me with time. But I remember the first time I saw Pulp Fiction, I was like, this is weird. Like, why? It it is weird. And see, you explaining just now the Pulp Magazine genre, I didn't realize that was a thing. That makes it make so much more sense to me now. I remember working with this girl She was having a discussion with someone else about Kill Bill, and she had just recently watched it, and she was just going on about how crap that movie was. Mm -hmm. And I asked her, okay, I said, which of the parts did you watch, the first or the second or both? And she said, just the first. I'm like, for starters, don't do that. It's meant to be a, a part of one movie. Okay. Second of all, the second part's better than the first, but whatever. And I said, which other Tarantino movies have you seen? And she said, none. And I'm like, well, of course you're going to think it's shit. Yeah. Because you you really need to understand his style and what he's trying to do with each film in order to appreciate it. And you also have to have an appreciation of the fact that he does not create, like, mainstream pop culture movies. That's not what he does. They They do incorporate a lot of pop culture, but not in the way that Hollywood generally tends to. He's not a mainstream movie guy. You know what I mean? Well, he definitely wasn't for at least the first half of his career. He sort yeah. of has become now because he's he's built up this reputation. Mm-hmm. What Tarantino does is he's obviously a hardcore movie fan of traditional film from the 60s, mm-hmm. the 70s, a little bit from the 80s. So he takes ideas and themes and reworks them into... He reworks them by reincorporating and kind of reinventing them and then implementing them into his films. Yeah. So there's a lot of, like, particularly in Pulp Fiction, and again, I appreciate this so much more now that you've kind of explained the magazine genre, there's a lot of graphic effects that are one-offs. And I'm like, why did he do that? Like, there's no continuity. What was the point? Well, even this film could be set in the 70s. I was trying to pick up on when it was set, and I was thinking it's probably just set in 94 when it was made, but the fashion and the cars and the style that he films it in, it could be the 70s. Mm -hmm. So he was very much a fan of of a lot of these movies from the 60s and 70s, and by the time the 90s came around and he was making film, he pays a lot of homage to it. Mm -hmm. Just for a little context, I'm just going to list off the movies that he has made, just so that you sort of understand when mm-hmm. I say Tarantino movies, this is what I mean. This is an order of release, starting from 91. There was Reservoir Dogs, then Pulp Fiction, Jackie Brown, Kill Bill, Death Proof, Inglorious Bastards, Django Unchained, The Hateful Eight, and his new one to be released in July is Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Now, he's obviously worked on a lot of other projects and films, but when I say a Tarantino movie, there's ones where he sat down, he wrote and directed it, and without him, that there wouldn't be this movie. He's worked on movies before that and during, but these these are his nine films that he's known for. Can I just make a comment on 
the fact that he writes all of his own stuff. Yeah, he's very big on that. Like, having sat down and watched a few of his films now, I that is probably my favorite part of Tarantino movies is the dialogue he creates. That's his biggest point, really. The crazy dialogue that he creates is, like, some of the best screenwriting. Well, yeah, because you sit down and you listen to it and it's long and really quite... There's a lot to it, you know, but it's kind of pointless at the same time. If you just watched Death Proof, Mm -hmm. which is his fifth film on the list... And you watch that without any context, without ever seeing a Tarantino movie or knowing what he was trying to do, you'd be like, what is this shit? Mm -hmm. Death Proof was made in conjunction with a good friend of his, Robert Rodriguez, where Robert Rodriguez made an old school, really cheap horror movie about like this virus and zombies. And it was like so terrible that that's what they were trying to do. And Tarantino in conjunction, made an action movie where literally the entire plot of the movie is to make stunts. And there's no story about it. It's just driving around and crashing real cars into real cars. And he was trying to make a movie like you used to see in the days of Mad Max and Juice of Hazard, where they would like actually crash these old muscle cars into each other and have real actors in those positions and not just rely on CGI. So that's what he was trying to do. And if you go into that film with that knowledge of what what he was doing... You can appreciate it. You can appreciate it a hell of a lot more because there is no story to it. And it's just this... It looks cheaply made. It's kind of got no structure to it. But man, there's some cool stunts in there. He's definitely one of those where you have to kind of appreciate where he's coming from and give him a chance and not just take each movie at face value yes yeah so if you have never seen a tarantino movie i've always recommended jumping in probably at pulp fiction because that's a pretty good launch pad it's got a pretty good plot progression like it's in terms of tarantino movies is pretty mainstream you know what i mean it is these days it wasn't at the time because it, it was just this it was weird wacky low budget film that was very unorthodox I would probably also recommend maybe Jackie Brown because that is probably one of the, his more it's, linear. I was going to say it's definitely the most linear. And that's the only one of his nine films, quote unquote, that was based on an original property. Yeah, it was based on a book, wasn't it? I believe it was, yeah. yeah. He did tweak the screenplay quite a bit to make his own sort of feel, but that's the only time he's done that and I don't think he'll ever do it again. I really like that movie. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Why did you like that movie? Um, Because Jackie was a badass bitch. Oh, yeah. <laughs> See, again, why. that yeah. movie, um, particularly with that actress, really pays respect to the, the films that she was in in the 70s. She was like Pam. What's her name? Pam. Gria? Yeah. She was like girl power, all for it. She was a sassy, foxy black chick that yeah, you would like, see in these. All of these roles that she played were definitely like that kind of hard ass strong woman role and i think she just played it really well i liked her character a lot i liked the way he developed her i liked the way she played it Mm. and it it was easier to follow you know it was good i liked it while something like kill bill part one it's like a crappy 1950s samurai film Hmm. just the the shots that he uses the things that actually happen in it and the the music if you had no context of his style or what he was trying to do with that, of course you'd hate it, <laughs> you know? You have to appreciate how it was made. What's immediately coming to my mind is something to compare it to. Uh, I don't know if you saw it, but it's a Netflix original series called Danger 5. That's no. uh, It was produced... Fox Force 5. That's what it... Yeah, it reminded me of... Um, it was produced by an Australian production company, and the first season is all... It's set during World War II, and they're trying to get Hitler. So it's like it's filmed like a 60s show, and they've got all those sorts of um, cheesy lines and costumes and stuff. And then the second season is filmed as if it was in the 80s. Um, That's interesting. Yeah. So, and the whole point is that like it's got the film quality looks old, and the shots look old, and the lines and everything. So 
you you appreciate it because you understand where they were coming from. Whereas if you were thinking it's just a regular old Netflix special, it'd be like, what is this crap? This is so bad. So you have to learn to appreciate it for the way it was intended to be presented. Even to bring it back to Pulp Fiction, whenever Mm -hmm. they're in a car, you will see them driving. It's staged as if you're just sitting in a stationary car and the slides are running past the window. I really noticed that with the cab scene in Pulp Fiction. It was There's a couple of times. It was all black and white and it was really like shaken around a lot as if it was like a really crappy old green screen moment. I was actually going to make a point in preparation for this episode about how he likes to at the beginning of his movies highlight this is a Tarantino film. And you often see that him he counts, like, this is the sixth film from Quentin Tarantino. At, at the beginning of Hateful Eight, it says, this is the eighth film. I didn't realize that. Yeah, he always does. Well, you haven't seen the later ones. Mm-hmm. But even Pop Fiction says, this is a Tarantino film. Hmm. Um, and I think he starts counting from Kill Bill onwards. Mm. But a couple of hours ago, at the time of this recording, the studio released the first poster for his new film, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. And there's not much on the poster. There's Brad Pitt and Leo DiCaprio in the title of the film. But it says, the ninth film from Quentin Tarantino. Hmm. So it just seemed very his style, like he's still still keeping to that. Mm -hmm. Even in the name of that movie, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, is... A reference to classic movies like Once Upon a Time in America and Once Upon a Time in the West, both made by Sergio Leone. Hmm. We'll talk about his work more next week. Um, And going back to Robert Rodriguez, he made a movie, Once Upon a Time in Mexico, with Johnny Depp. Terrible movie. But they they keep playing on this classic title of the film. Yeah. So him setting the, the movie in late 60s Los Angeles and having a title like that, even that in itself is paying homage to cinema of yesteryear. So to go back to some of the effects that he did, especially during my first watch of this movie, I I didn't get it. It, There's no continuity. Why is he doing it this way? Because there'd be a lot of one-offs. And so I definitely felt that on a second watch, this was better. And I actually made a point because, you know, we're going to talk about it. I made a point to kind of pay attention and see if there were any more animation effects. And there definitely were. The one that I noticed first was when they're sitting in the car outside the restaurant and she says, don't be a square. And she draws the square. And then it Mm. kind of shimmers away kind of thing. And I remember thinking to myself, what is the point? But I I get it now. There's a lot of other kind of one-off instances. So there's some... Like, right at the very beginning, he defines what pulp means. And throughout, there's also some... When Mr. Wolf shows up, there's... You know, he says, I'll be there in 10 minutes. And then 9 minutes and 37 seconds later, he comes screeching around the Well, it's almost like self-referencing. Yeah. What is self-referencing? The movie's self-referencing. Yeah. Particularly with the, the pulp description at the beginning. Yeah. And so, now understanding what exactly that means... All of those effects make so much more sense because if Pulp Fiction magazines were characterized by having kind of a PC sort of editorial style where everything is kind of a bunch of stuff just kind of smushed together Mm. like that, that makes so much more sense for this movie now. To see there isn't a continuity in these effects and that's the point. You know what I mean? Why do you think the timeline is nonlinear? I really wanted to talk about that um, and ask you the same question. So I think, I don't really know why, but I kind of sat down and thought about this and realized there was kind of a transcendent sort of story arc, and that's about Jules and how he kind of has a moment with God. We go through the story progression and then we get pretty much to the end of the movie and then we go back to when that moment is identified, right? So from the point where they drop off the briefcase in the bar, they rock up and they're wearing t-shirts and stuff and we're like, how did that happen? Mm. Because we don't realize that Marvin was shot yet. And then from that point on, Vince starts to have a lot of problems come up for him, right? He goes out with Mia, she almost ODs, and then he's having a lot of trouble and then eventually he ends up getting shot by Butch. So you're saying that because he didn't believe in Jules' experience... He ultimately died. 
Interesting. And so the point that they go back to is identifying what that moment was. So you see the progression and you think, oh, that's just the way it happens. But then he highlights it by going back and saying, no, actually, this happened because this moment, this miracle happened. And he didn't choose to recognize that that was a sign. It's interesting that you observed that because I've always wondered why he's added in that religious aspect to the character. Yeah. Where he's talking about the Bible verse and he has this miracle experience. I'm just wondering why would you add that to Jules? But if you're reading more into Vince's character development through that experience, Mm -hmm. then that's really an interesting observation. Yeah. Well, and even the fact when they're sitting down in the restaurant during the robbery and Jules's character is explaining... I used to say this because I thought it was a, like a... Cool thing to say. But he sits down and says, actually, I think this is what it means now that I think about it. That's kind of the explanatory moment of what happens there. You know what he means? He's like, who am I in terms of this Bible verse? I'm the shepherd. And so it's my job now that I've been given this sign that I have to go and live that. Otherwise, the vengeance of God or whatever is going to come down. And that's ultimately what happens to Vincent. Mm. That's See, you say the 70s, that does not look like the 70s to me. That looks like the 80s or later. That's just my... What? The movie? Yeah. Well, did you see even Vincent's car that he's driving? Or He'd the cab? He's driving an old car. Or the cab that Bruce Willis is in? Mm-hmm. That thing is definitely from That thing looks like decades. the 60s. Yeah. yeah. Um, just the style and the clothes. There's not really any technology or references that date this movie. There's cell phones. Those were the 80s. and Oh, when Vincent's in the car. On yeah. The phone. And then also some of the, like the way Mia is dressed, that to me doesn't look 70s. That mm. to me looks 80s or later. She's a little unconventional though. The use- And the stereo and the stuff, the way uh, Marcellus Wallace's house is decorated. I don't know. I just, it screamed like- He had a massive late like, 80s, early 90s. tape deck. Yeah. Like that's, that's some old tech. Mm-hmm. I don't think that's 90s, is my point. That's... Otherwise, you'd have a CD player. We'll agree to disagree. <laughs> point is, I don't think that it's ever really dated, and it could be set in a number of decades. This whole movie is essentially a collection of random scenes mm-hmm. that ultimately take an unexpected turn. And yeah. that's essentially what Tarantino does with his dialogue. He, he seems to ask himself the question, okay, then what if this happened? You know, what if they said this and this unorthodox sort of event happened to these untraditional sort of characters, you know? They're all sort of criminals and all links back to some sort of gangster film. But he does these interactions in kind of a, an interesting and funny kind of way. Well, I think I understand what you're saying in terms of, like, taking a non-orthodox turn. Because, I mean, why did we need the gimp scene at all? Yeah, why is <laughs> you know it, what like, I mean? A, yeah, so... Yeah. You got Bruce Willis's character and Marcellus Wallace, he's going to kill him. You see this in a lot of films, but then he goes into the porn store and there's a gimp and shit just takes a very weird turn. So each scene sort of takes a traditional thing and then it takes a completely different turn. Um, You start off with, at the beginning of the film, Jules and Vincent. They're going to go do a hit on Brett, which you often see in these films, you know, you say... You disrespected him, you didn't do this, they shoot him, they leave. What if you accidentally kill the guy in the back seat? You know what I mean? And then they have to deal with that situation, which is a very weird sort of situation to be in. And I still appreciate that that question of what if isn't brought up till the end. So it proceeds how you'd expect it to. And then he goes back and goes, oh no, actually, this is what happened. You know what I mean? But I think every one of the little segments of the movie takes that turn. Mm. Mm -hmm. Um. Like, even when they get to Jimmy's house, played by Tarantino, and they're washing their hands in the sink, and then Jules has this argument about them washing their hands, and he's not washing his hands properly, and it's it's just an unordinary yeah. dialogue choice f- between these two characters, and the whole movie's full of that, and that's probably why it's so compelling, is because... For starters, you don't know where it's going to go. And second of all, when it does go there, to see these particular characters in this scenario is actually kind of funny. Yeah. I mean, gruesome as it is. It's like, oh, shit, it just shot Marvin in the face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, 
Well, even the the dialogue leading up to that scene about the whole royale with cheese sort of thing, it's compelling, it's interesting, and then the dialogue afterwards, it's still funny, because he's like, I didn't mean to shoot him in the face. Yeah, I actually really wanted to talk about his dialogue, and just that we kind of talked about it before, it's so long, it's so random, and he actually makes it very informative. He talks about, in particular, you know, I was in, in France... And you can't get a quarter pound of cheese. And why you don't get it. Because of the metric system. And he talks about mayonnaise and french fries. And then they also have a second one where they're talking about TV pilots. Like he takes something that's just like a word. And he creates a whole big long conversation around it. Yeah. For what purpose? To be informative. To be entertaining. But I mean, I really appreciate that. Because I've always found his stuff to be so well written. Well, this movie was nominated for seven Oscars, and it, it, the only one it won was for Best Original Screenplay, which I think it absolutely deserves. Mm. The opening scene and the end scene are the diner. It's bookended by that diner scene. Mm-hmm. At the beginning, you've got an interesting dialogue of choice by Tim Roth, where they're talking about... I love Tim Roth. <laughs> yeah, he's great. Why don't more people rob restaurants as opposed to liquor stores? And there's an interesting dialogue there. And again, it's informative because it's he informative. actually goes into explaining. He explains it. He yeah. lists a bunch of reasons as to why you would and you wouldn't do this. Mm-hmm. And the very last scene with Jules and Vincent, they're explaining what is a filthy animal, you know? Why would he consider this and not that? And they, it's kind of useless dialogue that people normally have in everyday sort of life But it's interesting to listen to. Exactly. And it's always so well spoken to. And to to go on from that, I love Jules' character because of the way he talks. And I think Samuel L. Jackson plays him so well because he is so funny. And Well, it's become such an iconic role for Samuel L. Jackson because of that. And just because, like, he's got a great vocabulary, this character. He utilizes it. But he's not afraid to punctuate it with curse words. Yeah. And I think that all together just creates a hilarious combination. Again, with his intonation too. You know what I mean? Well, even in that last scene where he asks for his wallet back. And he's like, it's the one that says bad motherfucker. And it actually says bad motherfucker on it. Mm -hmm. Like it's just little things in these these serious sort of scenes where Mm -hmm. it's it's very humorous. And that's what makes it so compelling. And that's why I think it's so high on the IMDb. Yeah. No, I love that scene. (laughs) He's probably my favorite character. He often lingers on a lot of visuals or scenes that you normally wouldn't. Mm -hmm. Um, You see this when they're doing the twist, the dance in Jack Rabbit Slims. It lingers on that for quite a long time and you're just watching them. You're just observing the way that they're interacting in the scene and it flows quite well. You also see this uh, with Jules when he's eating the burger. It's a very tense sort of moment there at the beginning, and he's just like eating the whole thing, and then he drinks the whole. That is a whole... tasty burger. Mm, that is a tasty burger. <laughs> and he drinks the sprite like to completion, just because he he focuses on these things. Mm-hmm. And then there's the the pocket watch story with Christopher Walken. That whole scene lingers on probably too long as well, just to emphasize the importance of that. So he just... Well, but at the same time, like, focusing on... He kept it up his ass for two years. You know what I mean? Like it's Yeah. yeah. Uh, Speaking of Christopher Walken, the cast in this is very strange, if you think about it. Well, they're all, like, all-star actors. Or at least they were. Like, Christopher Walken was old... An old actor who is sort of in later stages mm. of his career. John Travolta had a resurgence with this movie. He wasn't really doing much for years leading up to this. Bruce Willis was pretty popular at the time. He was, but he was doing things like Die Hard came out a exactly. few months after this yep. with Samuel L. Jackson. But it's just, it's an interesting cast to have mixed in there. You've got Tim Roth, you've got Eric Stoltz, you've got Harvey Keitel, which is an old actor at this time. It's it's a very interesting cast that flows In a pretty cool way. Yeah. He takes people who you wouldn't normally see together and throws them into these interesting roles. And you just see... Because you've got an expectation based on typecasting, right? And generally, these aren't typecast. Yeah, Travolta was not... This isn't the kind of role that you would have seen him play up to this point. Previously, yeah. Do we want to talk about Butch any? Because we really haven't focused on his character. And it's because, like, he really seemed, like, tangential to the rest of the story. Like, he didn't seem to be... It just seemed out of place. Yeah, he just seemed to be like, oh, there's also this other side story going on at the same time. 
Mm. I mean, he was important to the story progression, but he wasn't that important. And I think maybe that's just playing on, again, the idea of the genre of pulp fiction. Mm. The thing about Butch's scene, which is widely accepted and people sort of know this, it starts out mostly with that Christopher Walken scene where he's highlighting the importance of this watch and that's why he goes on this this journey to go back to his yeah. apartment and ends up with the gimp, all because of this watch. And you need that importance in there as to why is this thing so important for me to go risk my life for it? Yeah. He's, um, it they starts, really do outline that. Yeah. Well, it starts out talking about his grandfather and how he was in the war. I think it was actually great-grandfather grandfather father like this thing's been in the family and up people's butts for generations apparently so (laughs) well this is butch's equivalent of that war yes this is his vietnam keeping it up his ass kind of thing yeah um and that's the point of butch's story is this this is his fight for the watch Mm -hmm. think about marsalis you don't see marsalis's face i think until he gets hit by the car. That's a very car. good point, because when he's walking across the road, you as the audience, who hasn't seen his face yet, doesn't know, is is that him? That's what Bruce Willis's character would be thinking. Funny little symbolic moment. So we always see him, back of his head with a band-aid. As soon as we see his face, the band-aid gets ripped off. Does it? It does, because he gets hit by the car and he scrapes his head, and then he stands up and he's got no band-aid and a big bloody spot, and I remember thinking to myself, he gonna need a new band-aid, and then he turns around and we see who he is for the first time. <laughs> I didn't notice that the band-aid was off from that point. Yep. And he wouldn't have got a new one because they go running into the pawn shop. I thought that when they're sitting at the seats, tied up and gagged, that you could see the band-aid on the back of his neck. Really? It was gone. I'll have to take more notice next yep. time. And that scene is really a lot of character development for Marcellus, too. And I love him as a character as well. Maybe it's just these, like, funny black men that I'm vibing with pretty well. But I just, I love, he's like, hey, man, are you okay? He's like, no, man, I'm pretty fucking not okay or whatever. Yeah, I'm pretty fucking far from okay. Yeah. And then just even the way he wrote that, it doesn't feel like he's trying too hard to show that these black characters speak like black characters. I think well, he nails the the script pretty well there. You know what I mean? Well, Marcel Ellis's character is composed completely different to Jules. Yeah. And you see that on the conversation that Jules is having with Marcellus. On the phone. Yeah. Yeah. And he's calm and collected and he's talking very slow and he's very logical. And Jules is like freaking out like a motherfucker on the other side of the phone, you know? Yeah. Um, you just see that that composition there between mm-hmm. them. Um, so I don't really think he's trying to make a statement with his black characters there. I think it's just, he's just adding humor. He's um, adding humor with their vernacular, which is the way that they speak. I think it's an interesting... Because I've seen this so many times now, I kind of forget the little things that I had on my first reaction, um, because I, I've come to accept this is Pulp Fiction, this is the well, way it goes. And how many times have you seen this movie? Because I've only seen it twice. Probably like six. That's seven. a that's a pretty fair, like, that's a pretty good number of times. So, sorry, just keep going with what you were saying. I was just going to say that on my first reaction, I probably noticed this more, but I, I kind of accept it now as it's just a thing. Mm. It's interesting to note the relationships that you see in the movie, particularly with Marcellus and Mia, they seem like unconventional as yeah. a relationship, you know? When you first see Marcellus, you see that he's a big, bold black guy and they, they're talking about his wife. So you don't really know who you're going to see as an actress, but Uma Thurman in this role is not who you're picturing as his wife. Yeah. Um, and that's the same with Jimmy and his wife. When my wife gets home, when Bonnie gets home, and you don't see her much, it's just a snippet of her coming home from nursing or whatever, but it's just like this black woman that you don't, uh, you wouldn't you normally think as this this weird white guy's wife. He's definitely challenging like normal Convention. perceptions of interracial relationships. Yeah, and he doesn't highlight it. it it's just yeah, a thing. Yeah, it's that just, there. and I like that, and I think that was kind of important at that time yeah and when i say relationships i mean like just interpersonal relationships i mean even like jules and vincent Mm. you know that work relationship you don't often see that enough and i think it's good when they don't highlight yeah he's not like this guy's black and this guy's white and all the arrows pointing at it you know what i mean well yeah yeah well for starters he does write it down jules black vincent that's funny yeah that was funny um 
I think that we need to see more of that in pop culture because you always see the black guy has a black wife. Yeah, and just like, but not saying like there's anything special about this. It's just this is what this is. Yeah. No, I agree with you. I think you did. That's something that I didn't even really think about, but it's true. And Mm. I appreciate it for it. Can I just highlight how great the music is in this? Tarantino has always been able to put in some really iconic, obscure, older music that just works so well in the context. Yeah. Or that, like... Like, even in Reservoir Dogs, there's some really cool music I was just thinking, he wrecked that song for me with the scene with him cutting off the guy's ear. I'm so mad about that. I love that song, and now I can't listen to it without picturing that scene. But even, like... The point of that was to be like, it's this upbeat, happy song, yeah, and and it's just really ironic. So no, I, I definitely agree. He does a really good job picking things that work or that really highlight what he's going for. I think he would get older music that used to be more popular and repopularized it in a different way. Yes. Which again is totally him. Yeah. It's very typical of what he does. I always liked his soundtracks. After the success of this film, it was really tried to be recreated by a lot of other filmmakers by the late 90s and early 2000s. Just his style. Just the the feeling of this, this Pulp Fiction kind of quirky dialogue cut into segments, and no one ever really was able to recreate it or hit the nail on the head the way he did. Because they're not Tarantino. Because they're not Tarantino. Yeah. There's even an episode of The Simpsons where they do 22 short stories within 22 minutes. And it's a ripoff of Pulp Fiction. There's a couple of scenes there where they go into the porn store and there's just a couple of scenes there where they rip off Pulp Fiction and make a parody of it. Um, and you see this a lot with other other movies and things. Mm-hmm. I th- just think the formula of what is Pulp Fiction is is really hard to recreate that moment again. Yeah. Um, and I think some of the aspects of his later movies that I like the best feel like those early couple of movies that he did where it's just like focuses on the actors and the dialogue and the interactions between them more than some of the other more than like plot progression yeah yeah no i i definitely agree with that yeah i just think it's a really cool movie with really cool interactions and dialogue and it's a great starting point for tarantino if you haven't gotten into his filmography before and it's funny it's, it's funny, so funny in an unconventional yeah. way where you're not supposed to be laughing at this, but I am. And you can't help it because it's, yeah, no, it's good. Go check it out. It's a cool movie. We have been Daniel and Brenton this week. Thanks for joining us. Feel free to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts or comment on SoundCloud. And until next week, thanks for listening. By millions of film lovers from around the world. Lovers? Lovers. Lovers. Film lovers. Film lover. I'm a film lover. (laughs)